Uh, my name is Kevin Harrington. I'll introduce myself and ask the other judges to introduce themselves. And then I'd welcome uh, the team from Marist uh, to introduce yourselves as well. Um, I uh, lead uh, R&D for uh, Beckton Dickinson's home care business, part of urology and critical care. I, uh, I live and work here in the Atlanta, Georgia area, um, although I'm from the Midwest uh, where I lived for several years and I know one of my fellow judges is with us here today from the same area. So I'd, I'll ask the other judges to introduce yourselves um, and, and then the Maris team to introduce yourself also. So Hi, I'll go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Maria Sonnen um, and I am very happy to be here. I'm glad to see you all. Um, as I mentioned, I'm in Southern New Hampshire waiting for the snow to start, um, but uh, professionally, um, I am the ethics program manager for um, the electronic systems business division of BAE Systems Incorporated. Uh, so that's a whole big mouthful. Um, but basically, I help manage the ethics program um, at BAE Systems. Um, we are a very large uh, defense contractor in, aer in, um, in aeronautics. So this topic that you have is, is actually very relevant to what we do. Um, I will disclose that uh, Boeing is a um, customer of ours, um, so uh, full disclosure. Prior to joining BAE Systems, um, I was at the uh, ECOA, now the ECI, with my fellow judges, Carrie and Rebecca, so very happy to see both of you. Um, and I've been involved in IBEC for, gosh, probably about a decade, um, love IBEC, I'm always excited to be part of it. So welcome and good luck. Um, I guess I'll go next. Uh, hey, Maria and Carrie, it's great to see you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Rebecca Rehm. I'm a compliance business partner at Olympus Corporation of the Americas up in the Boston area office. And I support our medical device business. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, before that, as Maria said, uh, we worked together at, at what's now the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, and I got to get, know Carrie through that as well. Uh, so I've been doing ethics and, ethics and compliance work for about nine years. I've uh, been a part of uh, judging IBEC for a few years now and really looking forward to this. I guess I'll go. Um, I'm Greg Mayer. This is my first year judging. Um, I'm a patent attorney, and I know Kevin because we work together at a medical device company called Hollister. Um, and every patent attorney has a technical background. Mine is aerospace. So it's really fun to hear um, that there's another aerospace person in the Zoom. Um, I worked for two years for McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, which is now part of Boeing, and uh, then decided to change careers and go to law school. Uh, I've been a patent attorney for about 26 years now. And uh, I'm with a law firm now that's based in San Francisco, but it's a completely virtual firm and I'm based in the Chicago area. And I'll go next. Hello, everybody. And um, it's really nice to meet the team and want to thank you in advance for all of your hard work in preparing for this session. Really looking forward to what you're going to cover today. Um, so I'm Carrie Penman. I'm the Chief Risk and Compliance Officer for Navex Global, which is actually an ethics and compliance and risk software company. Um, some of the work that we do is uh, answering hotlines for uh, our customers so that their employees can report issues of wrongdoing or suspected wrongdoing. And I suspect that, you know, the reporting might be part of your discussion today. So um, also, I guess, as Rebecca and Maria mentioned before that, I was at the Ethics and Compliance Officer Association. And before that, I was at Westinghouse Electric Corporation. So also in manufacturing, I was the first ethics officer there starting in 94 and helped to build out a program for our organization uh, at a time when a lot of organizations didn't have them. And so we were, there was a group of folks who were actually at the association that Rebecca and Maria and I talked about that kind of all figured out how, how we should do this. So I'm um, just really, really happy to, to hear you guys today and to meet you guys today and um, wish you best of luck in your presentation. Really looking forward to hearing it. Thanks everybody. Um, Maris team, can, can you all introduce yourselves? 
Sure, um, I'll go first. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Jana Brzozowski. I'm a senior studying business administration with concentrations in finance and international business. Um, on campus, I co-founded and I'm currently the president of Marist Women in Business. I'm also co-president of the Investment Club and post-graduation, I'll be starting as an analyst at JP Morgan Chase. Yeah, I can go next. Hi, I'm Megan Confino. I am a senior at Marist College. Um, I'm a business major with a concentration in finance and a minor in data science and analytics. Um, I am also one of the co-founders of Marist Women in Business and the vice president. And after graduation, I will be working for a financial planning firm. Hi, I'm Skylar. I'm a junior. Um, I am a business administration major with a concentration in finance and a minor in economics. And then on campus, I'm the treasurer of Investment Club. And this summer, I have an internship at City as a summer financial analyst. Hi. Really good. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> My name's Emma. I'm a sophomore business major with dual concentrations in finance and marketing. I'm a member of the honors program. And on campus, I work as a tour guide, a coach for the Marist Poll, and an ambassador to both the Office of Admissions and the School of Management. Wow, that's excellent. Really good. Um, Marist team, thanks again for being here. I'm going to do a, uh, uh, a short discussion before we begin the simulation. Uh, once, we, uh, once I'm done, we'll, we'll begin the simulation and I'll invite you all to, to start. So uh, this is the full presentation portion of the competition, as I'm sure you may have read already in this part of the competition. Uh, you're taking on a, a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to uh, Maria, Greg, uh, Kari, and Rebecca and I. Um, please make sure everyone knows who you are and who, uh, and who we are as well before you begin. Uh, you'll have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for about 20 minutes. During the Q&A, both you and the judges will stay in character consistent with the simulation. After the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside of the role-playing exercise and form. However, uh, actually, I'm sorry, um, some important things to keep in mind. The ethical aspects of your analysis are the most important part. However, these should be described in a simple, practical, common sense fashion, using technical philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. During this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking role. Unless there are any questions, uh, Maris team, please go ahead and begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jana Brzozowski, and with me today are Megan Confino, Skylar Harrison, and Emma Lohr. We want to thank the current board for being with us today. The students of Marist College would like to address the idea of whether or not the Boeing company is acting in an ethical manner in regards to the Boeing 737 MAX crisis. Throughout this presentation, we will help you see how the Boeing company can do a better job following their core values, which emphasize safety, security, and always doing the right thing as well as how they can reestablish their ethical practices. We will be analyzing the Boeing company by looking at the legal, financial, and ethical lenses, and we hope to guide you to a solution on how Boeing can improve its ethics while still remaining profitable and abiding by all US laws and regulations. After compiling our research, we came up with our problem statement, which reads, Boeing is too big not to be ethical as his status puts them in a position to be above unethical standards. As our college president has emphasized, ethics isn't about only doing the right thing, it's good business. Here we have mapped out the timeline of the Boeing 737 MAX crisis. The 737 was announced in 2011 and first flew commercially in 2017. In 2018, we see growth of the aircraft. However, the major incidents occurred shortly thereafter in 2019, and the 737 MAX model was not grounded until 2020. 
It should be noted that there are incidents and headlines coming ab out about the 737 MAX crisis to this day, but that our presentation will primarily focus on the incidents and respective response of 2019. I will now be going into the legal aspects of Boeing. Um, in this part of the presentation, I will be talking about the civil lawsuits, the fraud conspiracy against the US and shareholder lawsuits. Here we have a timeline of lawsuits in Boeing's history. Starting in 1989 and going through 2021, we can see that Boeing has not been abiding by all US laws or regulations. Most recently in 2020 and 2021, there were major civil and shareholder lawsuits and fraud conspiracy. So the civil lawsuit was over the Ethiopian Airlines 737 MAX crash. It had crashed in March of 2019 and killed everyone on board. The lawsuit is based on wrongful death and the goal was to prove that Boeing's conduct was reckless. Lead counsel Robert Clifford thought that Boeing knew about the MAX issues, especially after the first fatal crash involving a Lion Air 737 MAX jet. The FAA expected Boeing to receive more civil lawsuits stemming from its alleged lack of candor in its dealings with regulators before and after the two MAX crashes, and from the most recent 737-500 that crashed in the Java Sea carrying 62 people in February of 2021. The Boeing company entered into an agreement with the Department of Justice to resolve a criminal charge related to a conspiracy to, to defraud the FAA's aircraft evaluation group in connection with the FAA AEG's evaluation of Boeing's 737 MAX airplane. Boeing was charged with one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States, and according to the Justice Department, the two aviators conspired to deceive the FAA for their benefit and for Boeing's. Under the terms of the DPA, Boeing will pay a total criminal monetary amount of over $2.5 billion. From that $2.5 billion, there was a criminal monetary penalty of $243.6 million, compensation, compensation payments to Boeing's 737 MAX airline customers of $1.77 billion, and the establishment of a $500 million crash victim beneficiaries fund to compensate the heirs, relatives, and legal beneficiaries of the 346 passengers who died in the Boeing 737 MAX crashes of Lion Air Flight 610 and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. Shareholders have also filed a lawsuit against Boeing, alleging that they were defrauded over the 737 MAX's safety deficiencies and alleges that Boeing effectively put profit profitability and growth ahead of airplane safety and honesty. The lawsuit accuses Boeing of rushing production of the 737 MAX in an effort to beat Airbus, its European rival. It also accuses Boeing of leaving out extra or potential features the shareholders believe may have prevented the crash. So from all the data collected on a legal stance, the practices on this slide should have already been in place and are very straightforward. That being said, Boeing shouldn't be allowed to inspect their own planes. They need to put safety over profits. They need to ensure the planes are safe to fly and they shouldn't put competition over the safety of its customers. We will now analyze the Boeing company through a financial lens. We will look, into, we will look at their financial standing, their market share, their ties with the US government and whether or not the company is too big to fail. We analyzed the Boeing company's financials between 2018 and 2020. It's important to note that this is the time period in which the two 737 MAX accidents occurred. Over this three-year period, Boeing's revenue steadily decreased year over year. This is attributed to the decline in revenue from its commercial aviation business unit, which houses the 737 MAX. This decline was partially offset by the increase in revenue of their defense, space, and security business unit, which has the U.S. government as its largest customer. Inventory turnover also steadily decreased year over year. This can be attributed to the grounding of the 737 MAX fleet, especially in 2020, which provided for 40% of the Boeing company's assets. Over the past three years, total liabilities increased year over year. As Skylar mentioned earlier, this is due to the numerous lawsuits for the 737 MAX crashes. In addition, the Boeing company paid condolence packages to those affected by the crash. In total, the company lost an estimated 20 billion due to the accidents and grounding of the, seven, of the Boeing 737 MAX fleet. 
All of this is indicative that the Boeing company is taking a severe financial hit by behaving in an unethical manner. Boeing and Airbus hold a duopoly over the, commercial, over the global commercial aviation market. Both hold a combined 91% of market share. This creates a high level of competition between the two as each wants to outdo the other in an effort to gain more market share. Airbus's 320neo is the direct competitor of the 737 MAX. Because Airbus rolled out this model first, Boeing felt the need to expedite the rollout of its 737 MAX in order to not lag behind its competitor. This caused a higher focus on timing rather than focus on important details, such as ensuring all systems of the aircraft are working perfectly. 26.7% of Boeing's 2020 revenue came from its commercial aviation business unit, while 79.1% of Airbus's 2020 revenue came from its commercial aviation business unit. This indicates that while Boeing and Airbus both have control over the commercial aviation industry, Airbus is able to dedicate a larger portion of its resources, so it's able to focus more so on maintenance and development of products that fall within its commercial aviation business unit. So next we took, took, we had taken a look at the US government ties. So Boeing is the biggest American aerospace, com American aerospace company. And as previously mentioned, the US government is Boeing's largest customer. 31% of Boeing's $92.3 billion revenue in 2019 came from the US government. Not only is Boeing big in the US government, but also the United States military. And this plays a large part in how the government views the company. As well, the Boeing has been, for the past three years, Boeing has been the US government's second largest defense contractor. We're not saying that this relationship is unethical, but it is the way both the US government and Boeing go about this relationship that can make it unethical. Boeing is able to take more risk and the US government turns more of a blind eye, which that is the unethical part of the relationship. From that, we saw that Boeing was deemed too big to fail. Being deemed too big to fail is for financial institutions, mostly large banks that came out of the 2007, 2008 stock market um, crash. Being too big to fail means that a company is too large and too imperative to the economic system that if they were to, to be seen to face potential failure, the government would need to help and bail them out. Boeing it, too big to fail status is a rollover from the 2007, 2008 stock market crash and has been in question ever since the 737 MAX plane crashes had occurred. They had to ground all of their jets, both internationally and domestically, which made this title incredibly controversial. Failing for Boeing would amount to restructuring debts in the Chapter 11 Code of Bankruptcy, but this doesn't mean that planes would stop being made and that the military wouldn't be able to receive their products. An example of being not too big to fail and also failing in the sense of bailouts and bankruptcy was the American manufacturing company, General Motors. The company is very similar to Boeing in the sense that they could do the same process if they were not to have their too big to fail status. GM did go bankrupt and they did close down for a small amount of time. The government had to come in and step in and help for a short period of time as well. However, they were, to declare, they were able to declare bankruptcy, restructure, and now they are some of the best selling cars in America today. This did not jeopardize GM's standing in the long run. And Boeing's business with their current revenue is even more profitable than GM. So if they were to take that route and lose their too big to fail status because of their unethical practices, they would declare, restructure, and recover. For the ethics portion of our presentation, we will discuss the ethical implications of the role of a CEO, the whistleblower, why the FAA allowed Boeing to conduct their own inspections, and then the ethical considerations by competitors. Before we get into that, I'd like to remind you, the board, of our current mission statement. The current Boeing mission statement reads, people working together as a global enterprise for aerospace industry leadership. It is clear that this shows Boeing's focus on market leadership rather than ethics. And we want to emphasize and remind you again, the board of this mission statement, as it is what sets the tone for corporate culture, business decisions, and the organization as a whole, and really should be thought of while we're going through the rest of our presentation. 
So for the role of the CEO, I want to lay down a context of what a CEO should and shouldn't do. Some positive attributes being guiding and evaluating executive leaders, working closely with the board of directors, and really overall being a positive and inspiring head of the company. On the other hand, a CEO should not abuse their power, create a toxic culture, or act unethically. And at the root, we really believe that the CEO does hold responsibility for a company's decisions and actions. To apply this to Boeing, we'd like to note the change of executive leadership experience during the crisis. So previous CEO, as you know, Dennis Muhlenberg was terminated in December, 2019 for not properly handling the situation and crisis. And he was promptly replaced by David Calhoun, who was prior, the, prior served as the chairman of the board for Boeing. And this sparks a lot of controversy, seeing as Calhoun held a leadership position and an important one at that in the company during the time that the same fallout that Muhlenberg was fired for. This brings to light the question of whether Calhoun is the right successor for CEO. And this is intensified by the fact that during Muhlenberg's time as CEO, Calhoun stated that he believed Muhlenberg was doing everything right in the context of the crisis. From an ethical standpoint, this makes one curious about whether similar leadership attributes will be brought over and if Calhoun will actually be able to address and fix Boeing rep Boeing's reputation and current standing. Issues with the 737 MAX while it was still in production were brought up to upper management. Ed Pearson is a former Boeing manager who warned the company about issues with the aircraft at a factory in Washington state in the months leading up to the accidents. He also attempted to bring to light the ethical lapses surrounding the inspection of the aircrafts and the potential for an engine failure, namely being a push to get everything done as quickly as possible. These concerns were overlooked by upper management due to their haste in bringing the product to market. So next, we took an example of the Johnson & Johnson Tylenol crisis. This was a major ethical issue. In 1982, Johnson & Johnson had administered Tylenol capsules. And in a small place in Chicago, seven people died because the capsules were laced with potassium cyanide. Now, Johnson & Johnson was faced with a major decision that the crisis team had to take over. Would they, one, keep the pills out there and help recover with a small financial hit, or do they do the ethically correct thing and recall all of the bottles in Chicago and take the bigger financial hit? After much consideration, Johnson & Johnson decided they would do what was in the public's best interest and recall all 31 million Tylenol bottles, not only in Chicago, but around, around the country. And it was valued at an astounding $100 million financial hit that they took. In the Washington Post the next day, they stated, Johnson Johnson has effectively demonstrated how major business should handle a disaster. Let this be the example for Boeing. Johnson Johnson stock rose after a couple months of recalling the product. Yes, at first it took a financial hit. However, the public and the industry saw them as an ethically correct company. So they decided to throw more support behind them. This should have happened when Boeing had the 737 crash. They should have immediately grounded the planes taken the financial hit and would be seen as a better ethical company. So now we ask, ask the question of why did the FAA allow Boeing to conduct in their own inspections? It's first important to note that Boeing is not the only company that is allowed to inspect their own products. In total, there are 79 companies the FAA allows to do self-inspection. The company's own employees are the ones doing the inspections and are on the comp company's payroll. This can lead to a conflict of interest and incentivizes inadequate or false inspection reports. As Yana talked about earlier with the whistleblower, there were issues found with the planes that Boeing chose to ignore. Obviously, Boeing was putting profits over the safety of its customers. If self-inspection wasn't allowed, the planes could have been grounded earlier and prevented the crashes. This goes into our suggest suggestion to lobby the FAA to stop self-inspection in order to put safety over profits and have Boeing act in an ethical manner. We will now um, discuss the ethical considerations by competitors. 
As we have mentioned multiple times, the primary competitor for the 737 MAX model is Airbus and their A320neo aircraft. The ethical implication here is that, again, a stronger focus on there, there's a stronger focus on competition rather than quality of aircraft, which has clearly been counterproductive based on the financial hit taken due to, due to the crisis. It should also be noted that Airbus has also come under fire recently for an ethical issue, specifically regarding an anti-corruption settlement. Although these crises are of a different nature, it emphasizes the overall lack of dedication to ethics in the aerospace industry and the highlights and highlights opportunity for Boeing to be the one to really take the first stab at changing that. There are a number of solutions that could help Boeing become more ethical, but we will be talking about the most important ones that we believe will help Boeing the most. First, Boeing should lobby the FAA to stop allowing companies to conduct their own inspections of their products. Boeing already spends so much money on lobbying government officials, so Boeing could easily allocate some of those lobbyists to lobby the FAA. This self-inspection has obviously led to many issues with Boeing, seeing that the two of, two of their 737 MAXs had crashed. And we believe that Boeing is too big of a company to not be acting ethically. So we believe that they need to lead by example. And this could start with lobbying the FAA. If a large company like Boeing stops self-inspections, they could be the leading example and could get the FAA to stop this practice. Boeing must move away from their ultra-competitive cost-cutting mentality. While high competition is synonymous with a duopoly, there is a mean to do so in a manner that will benefit both the company and its shareholders. One of Boeing's business goals is ensuring optimal value of their products to their customers. This cannot be achieved with this current mentality as a higher focus is being placed on reducing their bottom line as much as they can, rather than ensuring the safety and security of their products. If costs are that great of a concern to the company, they can reduce executive compensation. Doing so will essentially kill two birds with one stone. Boeing's reputation has been hindered due to their mishandling and, uh, and unethical behavior regarding the 737 MAX. Reducing executive compensation would indicate upper management is willing to take a personal loss rather than put hundreds of innocent lives at risk. This will, this will ultimately allow the company to begin restoring their reputation while also reducing their bottom line. Next is one that we have mentioned all throughout the presentation. Boeing is a big company, so they're able to lead by example. Being able to take the necessary steps to lobby and be influential within the industry will be huge for Boeing, and they're more than able to do it with the resources and status that they have gained. And we're asking you to take the necessary changes and even take a page out of Johnson Johnson's playbook ethically. Do what's better for the greater good than what's more financially better for the company. And our last proposed solution is to create a new mission statement. As we have mentioned earlier, we really believe that the mission statement is the principle that guides you, the board, and the top executives, and that it would be beneficial from an organizational cultural perspective to alter it, and that now is the perfect time following the crisis. So to get specific, our new proposed mission statement reads, people working together as a global enterprise for aerospace industry leadership that prioritizes safety and behaving in an ethical manner. We really encourage you to utilize this proposed statement as it still incorporates this focus on industry leadership that has been vital to the operations for Boeing thus far, but also includes elements of safety and ethics, which can be really reassuring for the consumers and the community as a whole. So lastly, we strongly urge you that if you do not take the necessary steps to fix the problems that are affecting Boeing now, the decision will be taken out of your hands, both by the public, the media, and the industry. And Boeing will no longer be able to choose the narrative or the direction in which the company will go in the future. We would like to thank you so much for your time. We are happy to answer any questions you may have regarding the information or the solutions presented. Hey, thank you very much. I, I do have a couple of questions for the team. and I wanna invite the other judges to ask questions as well. The, the first question I wanted to ask, uh, really specific to solutions. Uh, are, are you aware of, of other industries that uh, do not do uh, their own self-inspections? And, and if there are other examples of, of industries 
where they do not perform their self inspections, how do they do them? We are not currently aware of any under uh, any other industries that do their own self uh, self inspections. Normally, they would go through some sort of third party, and the third party would be an unbiased uh, party that could look at everything without being biased towards a, a hastiness of getting the product to market, but actually really analyze whatever it, the product entails to make sure it's working in an effective and efficient manner. Um, one example that actually comes to mind for me is OSHA inspections. We see these in the workplace so often to guarantee that even the classroom is of utmost safety. But why aren't we having third party inspections in an airplane, which arguably there's oftentimes a lot more danger at play in an aircraft up in the air than in a classroom on the ground? Okay. And, and am I if I understand correctly, airlines which, which operate Boeing aircraft typically are the ones that hire and, and pay inspectors that are part of the airline. Uh, but perhaps that's not sufficient, not the, not the airline's own inspections. There should be some secondary or, or third party uh, resource that has effectively or, or by default subject matter expertise to conduct the inspections without any bias. Do I follow? I, well, I, let me chime in on that just because I have industry experience and, and I know um, Maria probably could too, but um, I think what they're talking about are the FAA certification process inspections. Um, so before the customers inspect, it's, it's really, will this aircraft type be certified by the FAA? Really good. Hey, my next, my next question was with regard to the two examples you mentioned. Uh, first of all, uh, the GM example, and, and GM went into bankruptcy, and then I uh, came out of bankruptcy. Do you know what what changes uh, GM implemented as part of how they the way they operated differently um, that may have either benefited safety or, or resulted in overall better performance coming out of bankruptcy, contrasted with how they op were operating before bankruptcy? Um, I believe when I was taking a look into it, um, I believe that they had been spending unnecessary resources and whatnot and not being able to perform for uh, their supply base at first, but then with the government interjection and um, the ability to declare bankruptcy and restructure, I think that was what helped the um, General Motors, which is similar to what Boeing is currently doing. Really good. Um, I, I value your your ability to contrast the financial performance of Boeing during during the time of this challenge uh, was was that a negative impact of financial performance? Do you feel like there was a, a direct cause effect relationship, or are there other contributing factors to Boeing's financial or, or underperformance during during the period that you that you took a look at? In their 2020 10K, they do attribute losses even to this day and future losses to the Boeing 737 MAX. Um, however, 2020 was obviously a very rough year for any sort of aviation related company. So they did have some losses through that between 2019 and 2020. However, a majority of it was still due to the 737 MAX, especially since 2020 was, was when they grounded the entire fleet. Okay. Um, my, my last question, so if I follow, is one of the consequences from this crisis, uh, the chief executive was, was fired and replaced by the board chairman. Is, is the board chairman still the CEO in place, would you know, or has he or she been, been replaced uh, since in the interim? Yeah, so there was actually a short period where the prior CFO was um, sitting, but David Calhoun, who I'm sure you all know of being members of the board, was your prior chairman of the board, and he now serves as the CEO and has been sitting um, since January of 2020, actually. That um, on, I believe, April 20th of this month, so in about five days, uh, they, they will be Boeing will be voting on whether or not to have Calhoun remain in his position or to essentially vote him out and have somebody else replace him. Very good. Hey, my, um, my, my last question, uh, Boeing has had a, a history of, of their aircraft uh, in, in crashes. What, what is it about the Boeing 3737 
crash history with these two examples that that is somehow different or distinguishes uh, causes action or, or attention different from other other crashes in the past? Is there anything particularly different or unique about these two crashes from other occasions of aircraft uh, having substantial catastrophic failures? I think that in part, um, when I was talking about the legal issues um, and lawsuits that were coming up, uh, they talked about how um, Council, I think uh, Clifford, he was talking about how they believe that Boeing did know about um, issues with the 737 MAX um, when the first Lion Air one did crash before it crashed. Um, so I think, as, especially when Yana was talking about the whistleblower, how there were issues that were found with um, Boeing 737 MAXs that were not, um, I guess, dealt with. Um, and I think, it, again, it goes into the issues of competition and wanting to beat Airbus. So they were putting the competition of trying to get the 737 MAX out as fast as it could to compete with Airbus without use, taking the necessary requirements of ensuring that the planes were actually safe to fly. Very good. Um, otherwise, in terms of compensation for the, the CEO at, at the time of these incidents or, or possibly the CEOs and, and company leadership that's been in place uh, since, in, including the most recently appointed CEO, is, um, is safety part of, of uh, leadership compensation? Or is compensation or bonus plan perhaps tied directly to safety and, and safety performance? Would you know at all about that in terms of aligning incentives with performance and values? I don't believe it's directly correlated. However, David Calhoun did announce that he does make, he his intention was to ensure that that Boeing regains its status as being incredibly safe because at some point in time that was it, it's um, a big part of its reputation. Um, however, if he I, I do believe if he accomplishes that goal in a in a manner that the board deems to be effective, it could affect his bonus. Um, but there is no written or direct correlation. Very good. Thank you. Uh, those are all the questions I have. Um, I invite the other. Uh, the other members of the board to ask questions as well. Hi, I have a question. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you know, as a member of the board of directors, you know, I'm fully aware that we need to do the right things for uh, for Boeing and, you know, to, to protect ourselves as a company. Um, we, we have had a culture issue and we, you know, are working to fix that through leadership and other things. I really like your idea of, um, of updating our mission statement to better align with the values you know, we, we're trying to embody. My problem though is I'm not sure about the third party um, inspections and because it doesn't really get to the root of the problem. If, if we have a culture issue and people aren't gonna speak up about issues, then having a third party inspect, you know, what if somebody tries to bribe the third party inspector? Um, so I, I'm not, and I'm concerned a third party inspector might add more time um, to our, you know, delay our production. Um, and then that's not meeting the needs of our customers, for example, and that may have financial impacts and, and, and that's not good for our company. So I'm wondering, would you, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, continuing with, um, you know, with our current inspection process, but ensuring that we update our mission, embed our values, work on our compliance and ethics program, ensure that people feel comfortable speaking up. It feels like that might be the better way to address this um, to get to the root of the problem. What are your thoughts? I think for regarding the third party inspections, we find that using our budget for lobbying to really push the FAA could be useful not only for us, Boeing, but the other companies that are also allowed to conduct their self-inspections. And that from a PR standpoint, even, this can push us as a company willing to put that pressure, put the spotlight on the issue, and work towards safety in the industry as a whole, not just within our own company. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question regarding that point, but uh, we also feel like there is a lot to be done from an ethics and compliance standpoint. If you actually do go to our current website, which I'm sure you all frequent, um, there is a lot posted about various programs and ethics and compliance, but we think it's time to really put it into play and making a big move like lobbying and further working towards with this relationship with the FAA can be something that really gets in front of the public and makes a big statement in that sense. 
And I also think to answer the second part of your question in terms of trying to get the product out there as efficiently as possible without taking a major financial hit for your customers, if you do, if we do rush the product and don't ethically put into place these practices, then what customers are we going to have? We're going to have none because of what happened previously. So taking the necessary steps, taking time to do it and doing it correctly in the short term, yes, will we take a financial hit? Of course. However, in the long term, we want our company to be around for as long as possible and to have a great rep rep reputation, excuse me. So in order to take that, we may have to take a minor financial hit. However, in the long term, it will benefit, benefit us greatly. I also think that after these crashes, the public right now does not have a lot of trust in Boeing in our company. Um, so as Emma was saying, um, from a PR standpoint of it, I think that having that third party um, sort of inspection. And again, like Megan was saying with like, you might, we might be taking a financial hit right now, um, but it's important for the public to have trust in Boeing again. Um, and I think that for us to be rushing um, the production as we had been doing in the past, it's just gonna hurt its image. And lastly, just to add to that, the example of Johnson and Johnson, that was at first they took that major hit and then months later, miraculously, people were shocked to see that their stock rose. It rose because they did the right thing. They did it ethically, you know, for the people and the greater good. And people saw that. So what did they do? They started buying more Johnson and Johnson. They trusted the company and the company is still around to this day thriving, as you can see. So um, in order to do that, we may have to take a little loss, but in the public's best interest and the greater good, it's worth it. Okay, thank you so much. Greg, I think you were next. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I have I have a couple questions. Um, first of all, I didn't really follow the, um, there was a slide and I wrote down a quote from the slide in the finance portion of your presentation of the issue that Boeing's facing. Um, and the phrase I wrote down is, crisis ethically ruins too big to fail. Could you explain what you meant by that? And if, if you wanna pull up that slide, uh, I might not have written it down exactly as it was, but. Yeah, uh, well. I believe it's the fourth bullet. Yeah, yeah, that the 737 MAX crisis ethically ruins T TBTF. I just didn't really understand what that meant. So in general, the too big to fail is a controversial status. Um, many people believe it shouldn't be around because if companies create their own problems, they should be able to help themselves out. I mean, they put themselves in there. However, um, companies were deemed too big to fail in order to protect our economic system and the greater good. Um, however, most of the companies that were deemed too big to fail were financial institutions and major banks. Very, very few, including Boeing, were seemed as too big to fail. So what we mean by the 737 MAX crisis ethically ruins too big to fail, since it's already a controversial topic, putting in the ethical standpoint of being two major crashes and that being their fault and their problem, they shouldn't have a bailout from the government. So we believe that if these plane crashes were not to happen and they were an ethically run company 100% um, of the time, then the too big to fail status could come into play and could be easier for the public to acknowledge why they would be getting a bailout if they were to face potential economic hardship. All right, well, as a member of the board, I, I would posit that we're too important to fail because we are such a key uh, contributor to our national defense for our country, but that's a little off topic. Um, what, my other question is, what other options did you consider and analyze it, and how did you arrive at, at your recommendation? Um, I, I, I presume you looked at other, other possible solutions. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So if you want to get back to the solution slide, just so we can. Yeah, I guess I, maybe I should rephrase my question. So can you please tell us what other possible solutions you analyzed and considered? Well, at first, full candidly, we weren't giving direct solutions. We thought, let's tell them to practice what they preach. And we said, this is such a crucial time. It's important to really nail down direct solutions that you, the board, can take, um, actions that can be enacted tomorrow. Um, so I don't know if any of my other team members want to speak to that, but we felt like these solutions were um, among the top of what would be considered because of how 
easy they are to enact and to start working towards right now. One thing I'll just add on to what Emma said, we believe that Boeing is an industry leader, leader as well as a pillar of both American innovation and of ensuring the safety and security of the US government. Any solutions that we did analyze took that into account and we wanted to ensure the solutions we presented today were as feasible immediately as possible. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I just have a question because, you know, you presented that timeline, right, the, the long-term um, history of challenges that, that we have faced as an organization. And, you know, going back to issues happening, um, you know, uh, you know, 2011, and you even had in the prior one, right, starting in like 1986 and, and, and moving forward. And, you know, we as, as board members, and, you know, I, I agree with Rebecca that I think the biggest challenge we have is, you know, we, we didn't hear about this issue, right? It, it wasn't raised to us. Uh, in any way, shape, or form, whether it be through our internal reporting processes or an employee reaching, you know, directly out to a board member, uh, which is, you know, something part of the processes that that we as a board have put in place to hopefully make it um, um, uh, feasible, easy access for employees to come to us. And then I I put that in kind of play with your with your suggestions around the mission statement. And to Rebecca's point, the challenge that we have with all of these things that you have listed here, 1989, 2006, 2015, et cetera, is we have a cultural issue. And so while we can change the mission statement, how, how do we implement that? How do we make it real? And how do we reach employees uh, to assure them that they can safely raise these concerns uh, and that we as a board will take it seriously? Um, I think that's a fabulous question. Um, and I definitely think a major issue with that is differing opinions or knowledge within different sectors of the company. So um, when I was doing research, I found that the marketing and sales teams were really pushing saying, hey, Airbus A320neo just came out. This is really, you know, coming, pushing, we have to work on this. Whereas maybe the engineering team was giving pushback, pointing out the more technical side of things. So to address your question, I think that it's really important to get all um, aspects and job lines within Boeing on the same page, um, whether that's better internal reports or whether that's um, interdisciplinary meetings, um, including the board, um, and now that things are over Zoom, that's something that is feasible to have head of different departments um, all on the same page about what's going on. Um, briefing of top managers within sales teams as, a, as well as the finance teams. Um, just that's how we can build this culture and really apply the sentiments that we shared in our new mission statement of focusing on acting ethically and really changing this corporate culture from the bottom up I think it's also important to note um, when Emma was talking about her the what it's like to be a good CEO and what a bad CEO is. Um, so I think that it goes down to also having like that top down culture. So whether that remains with Calhoun if he re gets reelected um, towards the end of this month, um, or if he doesn't get reelected to be the CEO and somebody else comes in, it comes down to the CEO and top management to be acting ethically and to instill that culture of being able to, as you're saying, having employees speak up about issues that were ha with airplanes um, and the production of the planes um, and any issues that arise um, from lower uh, in the company. Um, so I think it's very important that the, the, these top managers are practicing um, what they're preaching essentially. So acting ethically, so that then everybody else below them would wanna follow in their footsteps. Thank you. I think, you know, the, the challenge really for, for boards is that we don't, uh, you know, we don't always um, have access to all the information that we need, right? So, you know, I think as a board member that, you know, would like your advice on perhaps 
what types of reports you think we should be asking for? Um, what types of information that we're not receiving that we should be receiving when it comes to issues of safety in particular? Um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I think definitely the inspection reports to start. Um, so whoever is, what, whatever employees are inspecting the planes, um, I think that that would be very important for the board to see um, and read over just to make sure that the planes are safe to fly because obviously this was probably an issue with the two crashes with the self-inspection, um, whether or not Boeing decided to acknowledge that and they obviously didn't and it led to the two crashes. Um, so I think that that one would be very important for the board to take a look at. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, hey, thanks everybody. Um, we're gonna end the simulation and have a chance to share some feedback with the, uh, the Maris team. Uh, first of all, great job guys. You, um, I really like the way you, uh, you began right from the beginning. You had a raw, really strong intro. Um, I, I like your background um, as well. And I, I thought you did a real good job with your, with your problem statement. I like that up front. You, you really went right at um, defining what the problem was your, your organization, the way you structured the sequence of how you stepped through discussing the problem, I thought was very helpful. Um, you also had a real good quote in the beginning of, of your presentation as well. So um, thanks for including that. That helps to sort of provide some context, not, not to mention um, enables folks to connect with, with a common understanding of what the issues are. Also, I, I liked your use of the timeline. Um, you did that a couple of times during your presentation. That was a really good technique and approach. So well done on organization, well done on history. Um, you know, the, um, the, the one thing in the beginning I, that I, I want you guys to be aware of, and Skylar, this I think was your slide. You had, a, um, you had a slide in your section about new practices. Don't glass over that quick. That's really the, the culmination of that early phase of your discussion. Um, it was in those, those new practices. So um, let that sink in. Don't, don't gloss over it too quick in, in the future, okay? Um, otherwise, one of the best jobs I've seen in connecting financial performance with the, the issue at hand and how it reflected on the business. Um, I, I liked, I can't remember which team member, it might've been Emma mentioned, well, you know, we also have the 2020 financial crisis going on in the background, but, um, but that's, that's affecting airlines. It's not so much affecting Boeing. And, and that's a key distinction is sort of part of the case that's, uh, is an opportunity to perhaps untangle that a little further is what are, what are the airline's responsibilities versus what are Boeing's responsibilities? Uh, the airlines are the ones who do their inspections, they're who establish their practices and the way they maintain aircraft. Boeing is, is a consultant resource on that, but Boeing does not have ownership un unless they're simply leasing the aircraft um, to, the, uh, to the airline. So that lease versus own relationship is also sort of part of the equation here. I don't know if it, what that may have been between either Lion or the other, uh, the other airline that had the, uh, that had the 737 crash. Um, uh, one problem this, you know, for perhaps a little bit for Greg and I, it's a subject that we know a little too much about. Um, we, I know a lot about inspections and inspecting engineering systems, having worked in the nuclear power industry uh, for a bit of time. You know, two-man rule is, is, a, is a, you know, cardinal way of we, the way we do inspections, um, signatures and redundancy. And uh, the, the recommendation of having inspections done by third parties, the airlines do their own inspections and then they're backed up in, in oversight from the FAA. That practice is common in other industries. The pharmaceutical industry is one that comes to mind immediately. And, and you touched on it with Tylenol as a great example. And, and by the way, those two mechanisms or approaches for the ways you added and, and dimensioned your recommendations to Boeing by contrasting it with the GM example and then the Tylenol or the J&J example, those were real strengths in your argument. Nicely done. Um, I thought that was a strength of, of how you presented things. Um, one, one thing I wanna mention, you know, the do the too big to fail argument. I thought that was uh, certainly a, a plausible argument, but um, unlike financial companies, people's immediate health is, is a different animal. So um, Boeing is certainly a new, unique company. You know, if, if we wanted to, we, wouldn't, we could not create another Boeing in five years. It would take decades to create a Boeing uh, or an Airbus for that matter, even with government support and intervention, just by virtue of the level of uh, resource capability, capital investment, structure, technological know-how, and so forth. So um, it took a long time for Boeing to get where they are. We couldn't recreate another one uh, quickly if we wanted to. So, um, you know, I, I, I like your recommendations specifically to 
talking about how you link um, compensation to to safety. Uh, I think that was something you could work on and make stronger in, in future presentations. So please keep that in mind. Um, I, I like the idea of perhaps either revisiting your mission statement or reinforcing and and providing some sort of tangible mechanism by which people live, exhibit, or demonstrate the mission statement. That that could be an opportunity by which corporate executives are rated and and how their performance is judged as as uh, as well. Okay. Um, but but great organization. Um, think about what are the three or four key points you want to stress. And Skylar, that point of yours right in the beginning is a huge opportunity. Um, think further about your recommendations and how they have merit for Boeing, uh, not just the industry. Um, and, and and remember the audience you're speaking with about being you know either the board of directors or the folks who are running the organization, um, because we're, we're you're causing us to look at us look at us ourselves in sort of an introspective way. Uh, but but your third party view and perspective on things is why we hired you. So well done. How about for the other judges, any other feedback or thoughts for the team? Looks like Carrie has something. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with everything that Kevin said. I think, you know, that was really great feedback. Um, I know manufacturing is a very complicated um, environment. Um, there are a lot of a lot of different ways where um, things can go wrong and a lot of different ways where uh, raising of issues um, can be stifled or um, kind of redirected, if you will. And so, uh, you know, it's really important to, um, to really bring in, if you will, you know, sort of the, as Kevin was saying, I came out of nuclear too from the Westinghouse side and, you know, we called it the double accident criterion, right? That, <laughs> you know, two simultaneous problems happening um, and unrelated happening at the same time. Um, that's sort of what was happening, I think, you know, in, in the Boeing environment and for, you know, for ways to help leadership, right? So this is the board, help, help the board, help management kind of put in place you know, some of the um, redundant systems that will, if, if it doesn't come up through engineering, maybe it comes up through QA or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that there are multiple ways for um, the issues to be raised and to encourage the kind of um, dialogue that, that challenges that, you know, everything is green, right? You think in business, everybody has these red, yellow, green charts and, and everything, everything is green, right? Everything, every, everything is green. And so, um, you know, and that's when you know probably that that something uh, requires some additional probing because not usually, it's not often that everything is really green. So, um, so with that, I think one other recommendation I would make for you guys is that you know I would really spend some more time further flushing out those recommendations. You know, as as Kevin started to say as well, you know, to really help us understand what they look like in practice. Um, I think you you did some more on the um, on the lobbying. Um, effort on the on the um, inspections, but I th think some of the other ones to really help the board envision how that will work, uh, and you know what how you would implement that, and and maybe just one other point to keep in mind as you're speaking to the board, um, it's quite likely that David Calhoun is sitting in the room while you're talking about him. Um, because he is a member of the board, so um, I would just kind of keep in mind that. Um, you know, that there's always some, what's the word, <laughs> you know, some tact, right, in terms of, uh, of the way that, that you're speaking to the board, because, you know, people are, especially in an environment where there's been so many issues, I think some, some board members are likely to be very receptive because they want to fix the problem and they're accountable to the shareholders. But I think there are others that, you know, may, may take it personally. And so that's one of the things that, that you need to be prepared for as you're, you know, talking to the people that have been, I think, you know, hopefully trying to, to, to do their best to really solve the issues at hand. So, but I think great job. I think, you know, I, I, I as well love the timeline. I took you back to the timeline with my question and, you know, I mean, it's a real challenge for an organization that, um, that has continued to have these missteps in how they, you know, earn the trust of the public back. And I know that's what all of you were focused on. And I think, you know, great job on that. Greg, I think your head, hand was raised first. Oh, okay, thanks. 
Um, yeah, I, I think building a little bit, I think on what um, Carrie just mentioned, um, I thought, um, I, first of all, I thought you did a great job. I thought your slides were good, not too cluttered, um, but very meaningful slides. Um, what, on the solutions, I didn't feel like you walked us through each of those bullet point recommendations and said, you know, how do you analyze this from a legal standpoint, financial standpoint, and ethical standpoint? And if I missed that, I apologize, but I just didn't feel like you, you systematically walked through the recommendations. So I think you could have spent a little more time on the recommendations and why um, they were uh, the, the best you, you, you found. Um, uh, and, and I know, and I think Kevin said, we know, we know too much about this stuff. And so, but I think it would have been helpful. Um, and I guess the board probably knows all this, but it might've been helpful um, for, a, if you do a competition like this for this topic in the future um, to spell out what exactly was the problem. Cause, and, and my understanding of it, I haven't researched it in detail lately, but um, my recollection is that it was um, what's called a, a, a stability augmentation system that the acronym is MCAS. And um, what the way it manifested itself in these accidents, these fatal crashes, was um, the aircraft was um, adding what's called uh, trim, and so the, it, the the pilots had to fight against the autopilot. It's kind of oversimplifying it, but I think if you could have explained that and then tied that in with the with um, the lawsuit, I think the the lawsuit that had to do with the the aviators that were found to have hidden things from the government, um, that would have been that would have been helpful just to sort of set the stage and the background for the situation. Um, and then again, you know, having worked for McDonnell Douglas, which then became acquired by Boeing, I know a little more about some of the, the litigation they've had in the past. And one of the scandals that I think was very relevant was in, I think it came to light in around 2003, there was a scandal having to do with the Air Force procurement officer who was in charge of um, procuring a new tanker, re aerial refueling tanker, and um, and I think that person had been promised a job at Boeing, and then of course granted Boeing the contract, and then all this stuff came to light. And I think the I think the Boeing uh, executive was named Mike Sears at the time, who was implicated, and uh, and the the Air Force procurement person uh, was Darlene Dryan, I think, or something. Anyway. But that should have been in your timeline because it was a conflict of interest, just like the self-inspection is a conflict of interest. So I think that was a relevant uh, legal matter that you might have um, included. Um, and I know that's totally nitpicky, but um, uh, the other thing, and I kind of brought this out in my sort of role play thing, but I think it would have been helpful if you'd have laid out a few other solutions that you had considered and ultimately decided not to recommend. And then... And that, and even if you laid out some options and said, okay, of these options, this is the best one. Cause I think a board of directors likes to think they're making the decision and not just following orders from outside consultants or, you know, things like that. Um, so kind of empowering the board to, to choose the right thing. Um, and then um, let me see, I, yeah, I think that was pretty much it. Um, but overall, I really thought you did, and I, I know I'm nitpicking on a lot of this stuff, but I, overall, I thought you did a, a really nice job, um, especially of laying out the situation. Um, oh, and also, I just got to say, being from Chicago, you know, the Tylenol thing happened in Chicago, so I, I know more than maybe everybody else, you know, maybe not, but because it was a big deal all over. But, but that was a little different in my mind, because there was a criminal that had put cyanide in some bottles, and that and you may all know this, but I think that's why everything has safety seals now. You know, you buy ketchup and it has a safety seal and you buy honey and it has a safety seal. That, I think that was all coming out of that Tylenol thing. And so that was a little different because it wasn't somebody within Johnson & Johnson that was doing things poorly or, or criminally. It was actually just some, you know, uh, probably criminally insane person that was putting cyanide in the bottle. So, I, you know, I mean, I think their response to it, you're right on that they, they took a hit, obviously, in the short term in order to save their brand in the long term. Um, but that's my only comment on that. And then I got to ask, Carrie, what's the, what's the uh, aircraft that's in the picture in your, in your office there? That is, is that a, a B-25, Mitchell, or what is that? It's a B-24, and my father flew it in World War II. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Very cool. I couldn't help but notice that since we're talking about aircraft. Right. Okay, I know that's way off topic, but. But it's a, B, it's a Boeing, right? I mean, that's the history, right? Yeah, that, B, okay, I'll have to look it up. I'm not familiar with it, but wow. That's yeah, great. it was a big, big, heavy bomber. Mm -hmm. um, 
Kevin, can I'd like to give some, I know I'm not an official judge, but I'd like to give some feedback too. Um, I think that you all um, did a great job, very, very professional. You did a really wonderful job of, um, you know, sharing the time and, and uh, answering some really difficult questions. I think you picked an extremely difficult topic um, there um, <laughs> and then coming in front of a group of judges that probably know more than they want to about this whole thing uh, probably made it a little tough too. Um, but a uh, very, very, very difficult topic because there were so many factors, right? There were factors around uh, time pressures, there's whistleblowing factors, there's short-term profit versus long-term profit, there's who actually owns all the responsibility because there's responsibility that's not just Boeing's, right? There's responsibility with the airlines and the and the repair equipment, um, uh, the MROs and all of that. So, so really, really, really big topic. Um, and so um, I commend you for taking something that is actually really, really challenging. Um, I think um, a little bit kind of on what Carrie was saying about, you know, this specific competition, uh, you were playing the role of consultants talking to the board of directors. Um, and just um, remembering, you know, that that is your audience. I think as soon as you said something about, you said, well, we can just save money by cutting his salary. I was like, okay, I don't know if that's going to fly with the board of directors. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, and there was a few times where it felt like your presentation was kind of more kind of just directed on, you know, this is what happened. It wasn't personalized. Uh, enough to the audience that you were talking to, which was the uh, pretend board of directors. So instead of saying, you know, um, they did this, saying you did this, or your your responsibility is X Y Z. Um, I really liked how you tied everything back to the values of Boeing. I think that that was really fabulous. I think that's important to do that, especially when you're talking about solutions that are that are um, that are ethical. Uh, in nature. Um, and I, I would also have liked to see a little bit more fleshing out of the solutions with actual practical, you know, step one, step two, step three, um, maybe especially around the um, shifting our focus from short term profit to and, and competitiveness to long term profit and value for all, all stakeholders. Um, but overall, I think you, you all did a wonderful job. Um, and I know that three or two or three of you are um, coming up on graduation. So um, congratulations. It sounds like you all have wonderful paths um, moving forward. Um, and um, I hope that this experience of being able to participate in IBEC uh, has given you a better appreci appreciation for um, you know, the ethical concerns that businesses, real life businesses have day in and day out. And um, although none of you have aspirations to be a chief ethics officer, which is okay, <laughs> um, you're, we, um, I think it's actually great that you are walking into your professional roles with this background and this knowledge and you'll be able to help your company. So um, good luck and um, congratulations, great job. Thanks, Maria. Um, hey, Maris team, th thanks for a challenging topic today and, and doing a really bang up job. You really made me think about some things, which is the most uh, valuable, impactful part of listening to, to a, a strong presentation. Uh, do you all have any questions for, for any of us uh, on, uh, among the judges? And then Kevin, I think Rebecca had her hand up as well. Oh, thanks, Carrie. Kevin, do we have time for me to give a little feedback? Yes, Rebecca, please go ahead. Okay, thanks so much. Um, well, great job, Maris team. Um, I, you know, just to reiterate a couple of thoughts that um, some of my colleagues, uh, code judges said, I think you had a good amount of text on the slides so and not too much. That was great. Balanced presentation between the four of you, um, very professional. Um, I love that you didn't blur your backgrounds. I've seen research that says when you don't blur your backgrounds on Zoom, you come across as more authentic. So nice job. Um, a couple small things. Oh, and I really like the J&J &J example. So great job with that. Um, a couple small things I noticed on your financial slide. I don't think there were any units. I assumed it was billions, but just maybe add that in. Um, 
I agree more, spend more time on the solutions. Um, and then I, I must have missed it, but I, I, you know, your consultancy, I think, to the board, but I'm not sure if you said that in the beginning, but maybe I missed it and I apologize if I did. Um, and then the last thing was you mentioned at some point, you know, um, Boeing is too big to be unethical. I would argue that no company is, is, is you know, it, it, a small companies can't be unethical either, right? So um, I just, I don't necessarily agree with that argument, <laughs> but I mean, I hear where you're coming from. The impact uh, for, for Boeing is, is huge as a big company. So anyway, great job overall. Thanks so much uh, for, for your presentation. I just got to do a, an aerospace joke, like Boeing's too big to fly under the radar, I think is what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> We went with safety to the max. That was our corny joke. That's a good one too. Love that. Um, does the uh, does the Maris team have any questions for any any of the judges? Okay. Um, it was a pleasure uh, hearing your presentation today. I, I learned a lot. Uh, thanks for all of your preparation and your research, uh, and in particular. Uh, as, as one of as some of the folks mentioned, for those of you who are graduating soon, um, best of luck uh, on on the other side. Uh, I'm I'm sure you're you're going to do well, and and most importantly, thanks for taking the initiative to to be a part of of IBECC and and the work you did to prepare for for bringing this topic a, a really really insightful topic to to us as a group. Um, take care, and uh, we'll see you again in the presentation in the uh, competition. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job.